Hi, uh, today I'm gonna talk about our results in universal optimality and namely that Dijkstra's algorithm with a good enough heap is universally optimal. So consider the following problem. Uh, we are given a graph uh, with some positive weights and some source vertex S and we want to order the vertices of this graph uh, by the distance from S. And what's important is that we only have black box access to the weights, so we can only add, uh, add them and compare them. Uh, and we can imagine that weights are real numbers, but uh, we can't, for example, ask for the fifth bit of the, of the real number or something like that. And we also assume that uh, the graph is connected. Well, uh, when people say that Dijkstra is optimal for uh, for the short for shortest paths, they usually implicitly mean this problem. And so, with Fibonacci heaps, we can get down to uh, big O of m plus n log n uh, time complexity. And this is uh, in some sense tight because we have instances uh, that are basically equivalent to sorting numbers. So then the uh, sorting low bound applies. Uh, what we show is that Dijkstra is actually optimal in a stronger sense. Uh, and what that means is that for any graph topology, even if I tell you the graph in advance, but I don't tell you the weights, uh, and you are allowed to uh, have some al algorithm that depends on this graph that does some pre-computations and hard coding. Then your specialized algorithm uh, still can't, well, up to a constant, be Dijkstra. And so, uh, formally, we say that Dijkstra is universally optimal. Uh, and let me say what that means. What uh, how do we define that? So an algorithm is universally optimal if, well, if, uh, let's say you give me a graph, but you do don't tell me the weights, and you give me a correct algorithm uh, that knows this graph, then my algorithm is universally optimal if under this setting, the worst possible uh, running time of my algorithm on this graph uh, Given given the weights that we don't know, uh, is competitive with the worst possible running time of your algorithm on this graph. Well, up to some constant. So let's think what that means. That means that uh, if we have a problem that's somehow easy for planar graphs, for example, uh, or trees or whatever, and this. That then if we have a universally optimal algorithm, then our algorithm has automatically also be fast for planar graphs or for trees. So, so yeah, so we are basically like optimal for every fixed topology. Uh, well, and that's in some sense uh, somehow the best that we can possibly hope for. Uh, because we could want that we are also optimal not only for a, uh, for a fixed graph topology, but for a fixed graph with fixed weights. But we can't hope for that, because if some algorithm knows the graph and knows the weights, then it can always like just check that the instance is this particular instance that it's optimized for, and then just uh, in output the correct result in linear time. So we can't hope for, hope uh, to beat that. So it seems like this middle ground where we know the graph but don't know the weights seems uh, like the best thing that we can hope to have an optimal algorithm for. And that's that's what we do. Uh, what what we really have for Dijkstra. So. Why not just use uh, Fibonacci heaps? Uh, well, we can take uh, an instance like this that has these 
roughly n vertices in a path and then just some square root of n uh, vertices dangling uh, dangling from the source vertex and we can see that the optimal algorithm uh, runs in linear time because well to order the vertices by the distance uh, we can notice that the path is already uh, correctly ordered so then we just need to insert those square root of n vertices uh, into this ordering we can do this with binary search so uh, this the binary search takes uh, sublinear time in total and we get uh, linear time complexity in total well on the other hand uh, Dijkstra's algorithm with the Fibonacci heap can take up to uh, theta of n log n time. And, well, that's because if we imagine that the weights uh, on the star, on the dangling, on the dangling edges, are uh, much larger than the weights on the path, then what Dijkstra does is it starts at s, it inserts all these big weights into the heap, and then it slowly walks on the path, always uh, always inserting the next vertex into the path and then immediately extracting them and then just at the very end extracting all these vertices of the star and that somehow uh, well that means that like every extract min costs like log log of square root of n which is which is uh, theta log n and so we get like n log n in total uh but this seems like an artificial example because uh it seems pretty dumb to uh to fail like this uh because uh those vertices from the heap they don't really influence anything uh for most of the algorithm they just sit sit there in the heap on the bottom of the heap and uh only thing they do is they cost us uh in the extract min operations otherwise they don't do anything so but we can't not we can't just not ex not insert them because uh, we don't know if they will be useful or not but maybe if we chose like a different heap uh that doesn't count them in the extract min cost somehow then maybe we could hope to get uh, better time complexity. And it turns out that yes, uh, if we pick a heap uh, whose extract main cost is not uh, logarithmic in the total size of the heap, but only logarithmic in the age of an element, whatever that means, I will define that, uh, and actually we get this uh, Universally optimal Dijkstra. So this is this is somehow the uh, crucial condition that if we get, uh, we are good. And so, well, yes. So let's define what I mean by an age of an element. And so, uh, let's say that we order the elements uh, of the heap uh, by their age. Uh, by the insertion time. So on the top we have the newest, the most recently inserted elements, and on the bottom we have the oldest elements. And now uh, for a given element x, uh, the set of all elements that are in the set currently uh, at time t, uh, and that are that are newer, we call this the working set of x at time t. And then we can sort of look at different times uh, during the lifetime during the lifetime of this element x, before because it was inserted at some time and then it's extracted at some other time. We can look at all these working sets at different times. And then we just choose the largest one and we call this just the working set of x without without the time and so in some sense this is really like the uh the set of elements when the heap was largest if we ignore all the stuff that's older than x uh so this is our measure of of an age of an element 
and we want uh, our extract min to be logarithmic in this size. And note also that in the previous example, uh, like almost all the working sets uh, have size one because we ex we insert uh, the elements on the path or the vertex of the path, and then we extract it again. So, its working set is really just uh, just the element itself. So, then it seems that we will get this uh, linear complexity instead of n, n log n. Uh, so yeah, so so what we do, uh, what we what we show in the paper, uh, are mainly two results. Uh, so the first result is that we really can get uh, this heap that has this working set property. Uh, so we can get a heap that is basically that has basically the same guarantees as Fibonacci heap but whose extract min is not logarithmic in the size of the heap, but only logarithmic in this uh, working set size of the given element. Oh, and by the way, uh, there are heaps that have similar guarantees uh, to our heap, but to our knowledge, the guarantees of none of those heaps are uh, strong enough to also prove uh, the Dijkstra is universally optimal. The references are in the video description. So that's the first contribution. And then the second contribution is uh, that we show that if we have any such heaps with, with such guarantees, then Dijkstra uh, is universally optimal. Okay, so let's dive in into uh, the description of the heap uh, that I will try to sketch. Well, so... Uh, our heap consists of roughly log n, uh, log n heaps of exponentially uh, growing sizes. And to implement those heaps, we just use uh, Fibonacci heaps as a black box. And we put uh, we put new elements in the small in, in the small heaps, and then gradually, uh, as the heaps get old, uh, heaps get older and older, they uh, they gradually move and grow, so that's really important. And so, uh, yeah, what we maintain as invariance uh, is that well, we have heaps of several ranks of a logarithmic number of ranks. Uh, the heap of rank R has at all times at most two to the R elements. And what we guarantee and what's crucial is that if an element is in a heap of rank R, this means that its working set is at least proportional to 2 to the R. Uh, and so then we can see that uh, if we can maintain, maintain this property somehow, uh, then the extract min of an element, uh, well, the extract min of a Fibonacci heap costs uh, logarithmic in the, in the size of the heap, so uh, yeah, so then we get exactly this property that the extract min of every element is logarithmic in the size of uh, its working set. Uh, okay, so the crucial operation is insertion. So what we will do is something like in uh, binomial heaps or, uh, well, just in binary counters, but it will be something a bit different. So, what doesn't work but will work with a small change is that we just, well, maintain the size of each heap and every time a heap uh, grows too much and it exceeds its allowed size, we just merge it with the heap that's one level above and well, then the heap one level above can also exceed its size, and uh, in that case, we cascade the merging procedure up and up until we stop. Uh, so, yes, and then uh, inserting an element is just uh, equivalent to just uh, creating a new heap of size one and starting this uh, merging procedure. 
Okay, so as I said, this doesn't actually work uh, because we can imagine a situation where uh, all the heaps are almost uh, almost full and then one element comes and it triggers this cascade of merges that puts everything into this one, one big heap. Uh, and so now it can happen that some element that has uh, like a really small working set size ends up in this big heap and so we violate this uh, property that we wanted to have. Uh, but it can actually be fixed. Uh, I won't go into the details, but the fix is like one line. Uh, it's basically something like uh, we don't wait until the heap is too big to merge it into the larger heap, but we uh, merge it right before, uh, right before it becomes too big, and then this somehow uh, this somehow makes the insertion kind of staggered. Uh, so it cannot happen that a new new element ends up immediately in large heap. And if we have this, then actually I claim that all the other operations are pretty simple. Uh, so if we take, for example, extract min, uh, then what we need to do is, well, we have these log n uh, different heaps, and we want to find which one of them contains the overall minimum of the whole whole structure? Uh, so we, I claim we have we can have some auxiliary data structures that that handle that, and then we just well extract uh, the mi minimum from the correct correct heap, somehow update the auxiliary data structures with the new minimum of this of this heap, and that's basically it. Uh, so then the only thing that needs to be done is to say how we maintain these auxiliary data structures. And well, we can either use like a heap that stores these log n, log n minima to find the minimum of the minima. Uh, and this would cost us log log n time per operation. Uh, and what we show in the paper is that with some, with some tricks, uh, we can actually reduce this to uh yeah to maintaining maintaining some uh arrays of some some small arrays and then we can do uh yeah some uh we can use fusion trees to do this in uh constant time and basically that's it because then the decrease key is uh pretty similar we again need to find the right data structure uh, and the, then we perform the operation on this. Uh, we, we need to find the right heap, and then we perform the operation on this heap. Uh, the only thing that changes is that we need uh, somehow a different auxiliary data structure, but it's it's not a problem. We can again uh, do this in constant, um, amortize constant time. Okay, so then uh, we have this heap. Uh, and now I'll try to uh, sketch how we show that if we have heap with such guarantees, uh, then uh, this is already enough to make Dijkstra universally optimal. So on one hand, uh, we can uh, easily bound the time complexity of the algorithm. It just li linear plus this sum of uh, the logarithms of the working set sizes. And so this uh, linear part can be easily justified because, well, uh, every algorithm needs to at least spend a linear uh, time reading the input. Otherwise, uh, we could uh, hide some edge uh, in the input that the algorithm uh, doesn't look at, or, but that uh, changes the uh, ordering. Yeah, so what we need to bound, lower bound, is this sum of the logarithms. And we'll do that in a few steps. So first, we can assume that the graph is a tree, just for the purpose of this talk, because uh, it's not a, it's a harmless assumption. We can uh, we can do without it, but it's it's a bit easier to Describe that way. Uh, yes, so we want to show a low bound, and this has uh, three steps. So 
the first step is this uh, this folklore information theoretic argument that if your algor algorithm has uh, like if you can mm, by dif by making different weights if the algorithm can have many different outputs then this means that you need uh, and in like every time unit you learn only like one bit of information then you need to make at least logarithmically many uh, queries or spend logarithmically much time to even be able to distinguish all the possible outputs well if we have that, then what we show is that uh, we can find some structure in the graph uh, that proves that there are many possible outputs, or in other words, that proves that there are many possible ways to order the vertices by their distance if we use like uh, different weights. And finally, uh, we show that we can find this structure just by looking at what the heap, what Dijkstra does to the heap what the working sets are uh, at different times. And by doing that, we somehow, we bind, uh, we bind this uh, logarithm of the, uh, of the possible, of the number of the possible outputs with uh, the sum of the log logarithms of the working set sizes. And so now I'll try to break uh, these three steps down so yeah as I said the first first argument is pretty standard so uh, like if we fix the graph topology and we are allowed to uh, we don't know the weights we are allowed to change the weights as uh, as we want then uh, then the possible outputs uh, exactly corresponds to uh, the topological orderings of the graph, which is, as I said, now a tree uh, for simplicity. And so, by information theory, or just by uh, the, the pigeonhole principle, uh, if the algorithm does k comparisons, and since each comparison only gives us two possible results, then after k comparisons we can be in up uh, in at most two to the k uh, different states if the algorithm is deterministic, and so this means we can give at least uh, at most two to the k two to the k possible outputs, and so yeah, and so this means that we need to do at least logar uh, logarithm of the number of possible outputs uh, time, otherwise we'll give a wrong answer on some input. Well, okay, so that's like a basic tool, and now we'll use it in uh, in the next step. Now I say that we can actually find some structure in the graph that implies that there are many possible uh, output orderings. Uh, so what is this structure? Well, first I define a barrier as an incomparable subset of uh, incomparable set of vertices. So in this picture, we have drawn uh, some four possible barriers, b1, b2, b3, and b4. And what, what I mean by incomparable is that no two vertices from the barrier are uh, uh, an ancestor and a descendant. So no two, uh, no two vertices can be uh, compared if we think of, uh, of the tree as uh, some relation. Okay. And so now I define uh, a barrier sequence uh, as a sequence of barriers uh, in a topological order. And what I mean by that is that if we look at all the possible topological orders uh, the graph can have, uh, then in at least one of them, uh, the ordering will go something like uh, some, some uninteresting vertices, then all the vertices from the first barrier uh, clustered together, then some more un uninteresting vertices, then all the vertices from the second barrier are clustered together, uh, and so on. And so uh, what I claim now is that if I have one such possible ordering, and I actually have many of them, uh, and that basically follows from the definition of a barrier, uh, 
because well now I can I can look at the first barrier in the ordering and just like shuffle uh, shuffle the vertices however I want and what I will get is also a topological ordering. Uh, and so now I can do this independently for for each barrier. Uh, but then this means that uh, there are actually a lot of a lot of possible orderings, and namely that I can take uh, the sizes uh, of all the barriers, put put a factor real in front of each size, and like multiply uh, all of this together, and get like a lower bound on the number of orderings that the graph has. Uh, but now, what this means that uh, is that if I use the lemma from the previous slide uh, and take a logarithm of this, then this gives me a lower bound uh, on the number of comparisons that uh, any algorithm has to do in order to be uh, always correct. So, yeah, and so we can uh, do this like for every every choice of a barrier sequence. Whenever we have a barrier sequence, we can uh, we can use it to get, to get a lower bound. So now it's our goal to choose uh, to find a good good barrier sequence that gives us a strong low bound. Uh, okay. And so now we can close the loop because, well, we now want to find good barriers. And how we can do that is we can do that greedily. So we can uh, look look at uh, what the algorithm does with the heap and basically watch uh, the size of the heap and and then pick the time t where the heap was the largest possible. And now we look at the contents of the heap, which is some set of vertices, and we uh, we call we pronounce uh, this set of vertices the first barrier. And then what we can observe is that on one hand, uh, we sum up sum up the right hand side just over this uh, over the vertices in this barrier. Then uh, yeah, we sum up some working set sizes, but well, each working set si since uh, since we have picked the largest possible. Uh, uh, the time where the where the heap is the largest possible, this means that all the working set sizes are at most the size of the heap at time t. So we have uh, the size of B1 many elements, and uh, each logarithm is at most the logarithm of size of B1. So on the on the right hand side we contribute by at most uh, size of B1 uh, log size of B1. Uh, on the other hand, on the left hand side, so first we need to we need to say that uh, B1 is a barrier, and this follows from uh, this follows from uh, Dijkstra's algorithm uh, because well, what uh, how could it happen that B V1 is not a barrier? This would mean that there are two elements where one is an ancestor of the other. But these two elements cannot be, uh, in Dijkstra's algorithm, these two uh, elements or these two vertices cannot be in the heap at the same time. Because, uh, well, since the graph is a tree and Dijkstra's algorithm only starts exploring the children of some element, after it has uh, removed this element from the heap. So even before we even started, uh, e before we inserted the first child of some vertex into the heap, uh, the vertex has already been removed. So no, no pair of uh, the ancestor and descendant can be in the heap at the same time. So B1 is really a bar barrier. Okay. But if we now look at the left-hand side, we can actually see that uh, the first barrier contributes exactly the size of B1 times the logarithm of the size of B1 uh, to the left-hand side. And so now what we got is that we have found some uh, set of vertices 
such that they contribute some amount to the left hand side and some smaller amount to the, to the right hand side. So what we could hope for is that uh, we can actually partition the whole vertex set into such uh, into such smaller sets, uh, such that this holds uh, for like each of each individual set, and then when we sum all of them together, uh, we will get exactly uh, what we want. We will exactly get uh, that we have like barriers that induce a good lower bound, uh, and that's exactly what will happen. Uh, because we can actually do this process recursively. Okay, and uh, how we will do that is that we basically hide uh, all the elements uh, that we put into the first barrier, and then we again, uh, well, iterate through all all times, all states of the heap, and choose the one uh, where the size of the heap is uh, the largest, uh, if we ignore the elements that are already that have been already used. And uh, it's not it's not immediate it's not uh, it's not immediately obvious but it turns out that not only uh, does this process uh, produce barriers but it also produces a barrier sequence so then uh, actually that's like an important thing that we uh, need to uh, an important assumption that we need to. Uh, uh, satisfy otherwise otherwise what we just said is invalid because the uh, the left hand side can only uh is only a low bound for the algorithm if the sets are uh, a barrier sequence uh but we can do that and if we do that then we are basically done because uh what i said because all the all the in individual uh, inequalities hold and if we add them together then uh, the result also holds So, what we have shown is that we have a new heap uh, that's basically that has basically the same guarantees as the Fibonacci heap, but additionally uh, has this uh, extract min logarithmic in the working set size and not in the in the heap size. And we have shown that Dijkstra's algorithm with any heap that satisfies these guarantees is universally optimal. What we have shown in the paper, but what didn't fit into the talk, is that, well, we can actually use, uh, when, when we have our heap, we can actually use doubly exponential, uh, doubly exponentially growing heaps, and everything will just follow through. And well, this doesn't really change anything uh, in the amortized complexity, but uh, it's it's nice. Uh, for example, when we don't want to use these fusion trees, then uh, we don't get this log log and complexity, but we get log 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 and complexity, for example. And we want to, uh, and when we want to deamortize the heap, then uh, we can't get uh, we ma didn't manage to get this uh, constant time complexity but we can still get this log 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 and complexity so it's good that we uh, got one more log uh, into the thing okay and so the second thing that didn't fit and that uh, that constitutes a pretty big part big and the most most technical part of the paper is that we show that we can actually get uh, an algorithm that's optimal not only with respect to time complexity, because well, uh, time, com time complexity of Dijkstra will always be somewhere between uh, m plus n and m plus n log n, uh, asymptotically, uh, with with the, with the heap that we have. Uh, but that we can also be optimal uh, with respect to uh, the comparisons that are needed. And comparisons needed can be as, as slow as zero. For example, we, when we have a path, then since we know that the weights are uh, positive, we immediately get the ordering of the vertices without even having to look at the weights. And so we have shown that uh, if we have dice trust algorithm with our heap or with any good in our heap, 
and we do a few a few tweaks, then we can actually get an algorithm that's optimal both for uh, what both with respect to time complexity and with, with respect to comparisons. And the tweaks are, yeah. So for undirected graphs, it's something like uh, contract all bridges, then run Dijkstra on the contracted graph, and then uh, uncontract the graph again. And uh, yeah, uh, during that we also need to merge some uh, sorted sequences uh, on a tree. Uh, and for the directed graph, uh, for directed graphs, it's uh, a bit similar, but uh, a bit more complicated. We need something that's called uh, a dominated tree uh, that can be computed in linear time. And then we basically do some equivalent of uh, merging bridges. OK, so that was it. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, the papers on archive and I also put a link in the video description and yeah thanks for watching <laughs>